Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Clocked In with the Press, hosted at Altman Studios in beautiful downtown Brentwood, California. In this podcast, we highlight news stories, individuals, and organizations that deserve your attention. This is your host, Melissa Van Ruten, Clocking In. Today, we'll be talking to Doreen Forlo, local historian and former president of the East Contra Costa Historical Society. As a self-professed history nerd, I am really excited for our conversation. But before we jump into that, let's hear a quick word from this episode's sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at the Lucas Group, an independently owned and operated real estate company in Brentwood. The Lucas Group specializes in all aspects of real estate, working with both buyers and sellers to meet their home ownership needs. Give them a call today at 925-392-8926. Thanks so much. Hello, Doreen, and welcome to our show. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Melissa, and I'm very happy to be here. You're welcome. (laughs) I'm super excited to talk about all things East Contra Costa history. Like I said, I'm a huge history nerd, but before we do that, let's, let's have you introduce yourself. I will do that for you. I actually call myself Doreen Pierce Forlo. I'm a native of Lone Tree Way and Fairview Avenue and grew up exactly where the Winco Shopping Center is today. My grandparents, uh, Pellegrino and Anna Giannini, owned a walnut orchard there. And that's where my mom, Rose Pierce, was raised as well. My mom and my dad, Clifford, owned and operated the Delta Theater along with the, the Delta Auto Supply and the Lion's Den Restaurant across the street from Liberty High School. We also owned an almond orchard on Lone Tree Way. I graduated from Liberty High and got my master's degree from San Francisco State University and St. Mary's College. I taught at Liberty High School District, as well as Los Medanos College, and on the Navajo Reservation in Pine Hill, New Mexico. That's really exciting. So you are a true local to this area, there is no, oh, I moved here 20 years ago. Like you've been here other than, you know, going to college in San Francisco and teaching on the Navajo reservation. Like you've, you've been here. Uh, yes. I love it. <laughs> I was bit, I have been here since I was born here. Nice. And so before that, how long has your family been in this area? Well, my family has lived here since they came from Italy and Spain. So they as well has, have lived here since they got to America. Amazing. What year? Do you- it was 1911-1913. That's amazing. And so what was it like growing up in Brentwood? Thank you for asking that. I grew up here, it was in the 50s, and the population, I do not believe, was 2,000. So it was a pretty small community. Brentwood and Oakley both had car dealerships, tractor dealerships, movie theaters, and clothing stores. She really did not need to leave the area to be clothed and entertained and fed. Well, I think that at least has stayed the same for sure. (laughs) You can get everything. It it is the same again. Yes. (laughs) It lagged there for a while. For sure. But the area was very friendly and safe. Everybody knew everybody and watched out for each other. Um, We had many very active clubs that entertained us and provided entertainment basically for for everybody, all ages. Um, If you needed an event, if you needed a cook for an event, well, you call Mike. Or if you needed an announcer, you call John. One of the big events in the area at that time was the Carnicue, which happened in the Brentwood Park. Carnicue is, I think, a name invented in Brentwood. It's a combination of carnival and barbecue. So needless to say, part of the Carnicue was a giant barbecue. They raffled off a brand new car every year. Oh, wow. And then they topped it off with fireworks. It was great. I think, so I was actually, full disclosure, I went earlier this week and I I got a bunch of the the historical books from the library, the Brentwood one and the East County one, and they talked about the Carnicue in the Brentwood one. There you go. (laughs) So other than the obvious growth that we've seen since then, What are some of the other big changes you've seen in the area? Well, obviously, just the um, the amount of people around me. Yeah, and um, having grown up in a very small community, 
sometimes bothers me to have that many people around me. I'm, I'm kind of pleased. In fact, I'm very pleased that um, the Historical Society, East Contra Costa Historical Society, is located uh, at the edge of town on Sellers Avenue because that gives me an opportunity to get away from people and get out into the farmland and, and enjoy myself. Other than that, I was going to comment on the traffic, but I will do that later. <laughs> sure. I always joke, you know, I grew up in Massachusetts and, you know, we had small towns, I suppose, but I this is the most suburban area that I've ever lived in. So I definitely am feeling the tons of people tons of traffic around all the time, you know, being able to stand between two houses and stretch your arms out and touch one on either side of you is not good. It's new, you know, it's, it's definitely new to me, but. Um, well, thank you for bringing up traffic because that's one of the things that bothers me is the lack of respect others have on our roadways these days. And I, this is not Los Angeles. It's not San Jose, you know, so leave that attitude there. You don't know that the person that you just cut off in line is one of your neighbors or perhaps the mother of your son's best friend. Sure, sure. And everybody's in such a hurry to to get where they need to go. We talk about it on the news podcast all the time because I cover a lot of the accidents that happen in town Yikes. and so many of them are avoidable. And But it is with that many people on the road, it's... It's kind of chaos sometimes. Well, it's rude, and I yeah, we don't need it. I agree. Not in Brentwood. So let's jump into talking about the the history of the area, and I would love just kind of a a quick, maybe or you know I say quick, but a cliff note type rundown. You know, let's start with the indigenous peoples that lived here, and and tell us how. Brentwood, Oakley, the East County area, how it was settled since then, kind of coming up into when your family got here. Most people in the area, hopefully most people in our area, know that the peoples who lived here before the Spanish came were part of that Bay Miwok language group. And there were little offshoots in this area. I can only imagine that their life must have been fairly idyllic. I mean, the weather was nice, uh, the food both on land and in the river, was plentiful. They lived in non-permanent housing, so we don't have anything of that left, although there are mounds, burial mounds, here and there, if you look real hard. Unfortunately, some of those areas are being destroyed by housing developments. It is said, and I think it's probably correct, that the last grizzly bear in Contra Costa County was killed right here in Oakland. Oh, wow. Yeah. If so, we just had a bear, and I know not a grizzly, but was it last year or the year before? It was there was a last black year, bear. I think. Yeah. In, in Oakley. <laughs> yes. That's right. So the Miwoks, I think, had a pretty idyllic life, except they did have to watch out for the grizzly bears. Of course, the towns in our areas didn't just spring up all by themselves. Mainly, they started being settled when people came west because of the discovery of gold. And as you know, Tons and tons of people came here. More people came than there was gold. And many of those people learned very quickly that it was easier to farm than it was to, to try to make a living out of looking for gold. Because of the river, the marshes, and the swamps, our area is just really very fertile. And it sits in this nice little valley. Everything came down to us and settled right here. So farming in this area was luscious and amazing. The farmers, um, once they cleared the land, were able to farm everything from asparagus out by the islands uh, to wheat up in the foothills. Uh, even peas were, were, were farmed here at one time. That was in the Byron area. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> Pea pickers. Uh, anyway, this area produced an amazing amount of food. And in the beginning, it was shipped out by river and then later by rail. Belfort Guthrie Company, which is a company out of uh, London, England, actually, and did business in San Francisco, happened to stumble upon the Brentwood area and took the opportunity to take advantage of the fertile soil. What they did was they converted 
dry farming to irrigated farming by literally building the canal systems that were in, that's are still in use today in the Brentwood area. And if I remember, it said the first one was 12 miles coming in to, to bring the irrigation in. Right. That had to be an amazing feat for the time. Well, well it is an amazing feat. And, and if you're not conscious of what you're driving over or walking over, you're not really realizing that you're walking over a little bridge over a canal, but you are. I'm right on that that edge of town near Sellers. So whenever I go in and out, usually I'll go along Sellers and I see all the Then you can canals. see the open canals, yes. right? Most of them are still open. Um, so watch out, kids. They're not good for swimming. But, but when the orchards or when the farmland was changed by the canal system, then the wheat went away, the dry farming went away, and then the irrigated farms came in, and that was fruits, nuts, and all the vegetables. Um, they were able to dry the fruits and ship those to to Europe. And, of course, the nuts went all by themselves. They didn't have a problem. And evidently, we provided quite a bit of uh, wheat and produce for their market. So that's that's good. Brentwood prospered quite a bit from from that. That's amazing. And still does. I mean, And still does. Actually, it is farming that has built Brentwood and sustains Brentwood area. There were migrant farmers, obviously, who came in at the time, and there were different encampments that they would stay at, stay at. one of them being the Davis Auto Camp. Tell I us a little bit about Davis that. Davis Camp. <laughs> 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 uh, when I was just, I think, I, yeah, started the first grade, we lived out on Highway 4 on the south side of Marsh Creek and Davis Camp, of course, is right on the north side of Marsh Creek. So it was my bus stop, and it was our grocery store. What a great place Davis Camp was. Um, just a little little hometown grocery store. Everybody knew each other. People lived, you know, in the camps and in, in, on the grounds. And basically those were people who came here uh, during the Dust Bowl era, and driven out of their homes, out of their farms, and out of their jobs, and just came here in droves looking for work. There was plenty of work here. Um, and Davis Camp was one of the places that said, whoa, these people need a nice place to live. And the Davises built Davis Camp. And we have a wonderful picture at the Historical Society, East Contra Costa Historical Society, that shows a table. I'm not real good on measurements. Long, two, long. two long tables. <laughs> like as long as this room, people on both sides crammed with food. And you can see in the background more people bringing food forward. So it was a real family and a community. It definitely gives farm to table Kind of the birth. Well, that was farm to table. <laughs> <laughs> truly, truly. <laughs> yeah. And there were other little scattered camps throughout the area. And then, of course, Belfort and Guthrie had a huge area where people lived. They had little houses for them. They had a clinic for them. They had babysitting services on site. Um, so it, actually, somebody came to the historical society about it a year and a half ago, wanting to do research for their master's paper on how difficult it was to live in farming camps. By the time she left, she had changed her thesis statement. I was going to say, it sounds like they really knew the value of taking care of their workers. They did. And in, in turn, I bet their workers were quite loyal to them. Their workers became us. Yeah. Yeah. They became citizens of Brentwood, citizens of Oakley, Byron Knights, and Bethel Island. They became us. They stayed here. So that's how much they liked it and how well they were treated. It, it speaks volumes. And I feel like that there are some business owners out there, that you know, big corporate this. ones that could, could learn a few lessons from that. Those people, you know, once their kids, they work the fields and then their, their children of course, you always want more for your children. So they ended up working in the canneries and the mills that were along the river, made quite a good living for themselves, which then left a vacancy in the, in, in the orchards and farms. 
So what do you do to get people to pick the crops? They started what was called the Bracero Program in the 1950s, which was a legal way for um, Mexicans to come across the border and work here and have a place to stay and live uh, for the, for the um, season. And again, many of those people stayed here. And adds to the diversity, which is never a bad thing. No. <laughs> well, I love the history lesson. We're going to take a quick break to hear again from today's sponsor. And then when we come back, we'll talk some about the East Contra Costa Historical Society and the wonderful museum that we have right here. So stay tuned. Today's sponsor, the Lucas Group, has been in business since 2005 and is now offering clients the most cutting-edge solutions in property technology through Homelite's suite of products and services. Simple sales, trade-ins, and cash offers. For simple sales, the Lucas Group makes selling your home easy. Sell when you're ready without the hassle of paying for repairs, prepping for listing, or dealing with showings. Receive a competitive, no-obligation cash offer, typically within 48 hours. Close in as little as 10 days. If you would like to avoid the stress, risk, and hassle of buying and selling at the same time, the Lucas Group can help with a trade-in, a calmer, more certain alternative to real estate. They will buy your current home, giving you the freedom to buy your new home. And if your current home sells for more than the price of your new home, the Lucas Group pays you the difference, minus the selling costs. If you want to triple your winning potential, the Lucas Group has a cash offer program. The Lucas Group will help you make the strongest offer possible with a 21-day close for free. That means no program or lender fees. Call the Lucas Group's award-winning agents today at 925-392-8926. Thanks so much. All right, Doreen, you are heavily involved with East Contra Costa Historical Society and even served as their last president. Tell us more about the society. Who started it? When was it started? What kind of work do they do? Anything you can think of. Well, funny you should mention that. Because I am heavily involved. My mother was, my mother Rose was a founding member of the Historical Society, along with many, many other names that would be familiar to your listeners. Um, and that was in 1970. They founded the Historical Society, but they didn't have a home for it. People literally started gathering uh, documents, uh, files, items to preserve and preserve them in their homes as best they could until they were able to get a site. And they were offered a number of buildings, but they had no ground to put the buildings on. So it was not until 1986 that they were able to find a home for everything, and that was through the generosity of Cleland and Marge Nail, who donated uh, their old farmhouse and 1.3 acres out on Sellers Avenue. And so that is where the museum sits to this day. That is where the museum sits today. We have a tight little spot, and we're outgrowing that spot rapidly. I think we need to build up because we can't build out anymore. <laughs> um, but we're a private museum. We're nonprofit, and we're funded by our members and the generosity of people from the community. Tell us about some of what we can see at the Historical Society Museum. Certainly. Of course, our mission is to preserve as much of our history as we can, to protect it, and then to share that with you and the public. Um, we have the Byer Nail House, and we just recently, well, within the last six months, went through the whole house and renovated it. We took everything out, cleaned everything, and then redesigned all of the displays inside the house. Literally, you can go there and have a self-guided tour. Very cool. So every part of the house tells its own little story from the people who first built the house to the coming of the railroads. What does a 1886 kitchen look like? Um, what was the type of entertainment that people had in the 18, early 1900s? There's information in there about the Brentwood Hotel heart pang, uh, information in there about Byron Hot Springs, and basically everything you want to know about living in the 18. We have what's called Homer's Shed, which is also recently, within the last year and a half, been totally cleared out and the display completely renovated. And that shed, which isn't a shed at all, it's a very nice long building, tells the story and the history of agriculture in East Contra Costa County. 
It is wonderful. I got to walk through the shed at the right. holiday event, and it was after it had been all renovated. And it is so informative, and the ki- my kids loved it. You know, all the different farm equipment and and the the interpretive signs explaining what everything was for. They really had a blast. And and those are not the only two buildings out there, right? There are some other no, buildings. No, no, we have plenty of little buildings. We have we have the Eden Plains schoolhouse. It's a one-room schoolhouse. It's a functioning schoolhouse. You can come and have a lesson in it. It's really an amazing, amazing thing that we have, that schoolhouse. We were also offered the Iron House schoolhouse, which was a one-room schoolhouse, but we literally had no place to put it. Oh, no. But we said, we'll take the whatever you call the bell tower thing. Yeah, the bell tower, whatever that, I guess it's called a bell tower. We we took their bell tower and their bell. So our Eden Plains schoolhouse has the iron house uh, bell tower and and bell on it. You can come out and ring the bell. You can sit at the little desk that the kids sat in in the 1800s, and you can have a lesson with us. It's fantastic. And then you also recently, I think in the past five years, if I'm not mistaken, you built your resource room. We did build our, built a resource room, and I'm not even sure it's five years old, and we've already outgrown it. Oh, man. <laughs> we had lived in a trailer for all of our documents and photographs, and I don't, I don't understand how that much stuff could be put in a trailer. We would take boxes out, and then the next week I would go back in, and it was exactly the same, like all the boxes in the back puffed up with air, and it was just full again. So we have literally outgrown the Resource Center. We have thousands and thousands of historical photographs and documents, um, newspapers, gosh, the Rickson file. We have a lot, a lot of information on John Marsh uh, and, of course, information on the beginnings of all the cities in our area and the reclamation of the land um, in our 10 islands that surround us. Many people don't know that there are 10 little islands that live out there on the edge of East Contra Costa County, and that does not include Bethel Island. Bethel Island would make the 11th island, but there's 10 little islands out there that were all, um, including Bethel, that were all reclaimed uh, from the from the delta, from the marshlands. Wonderful. And, you know, you wouldn't know unless you spend a lot of time maybe out in your boat out there, but... I don't have well, a boat. You, you kind of, <laughs> no, I don't have a boat. I have a kayak. Same. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You even in a boat, you you kind of think that the islands were there. Well, they are there, but man made them be there. That could be a whole separate podcast. That's a whole separate <laughs> podcast. Thank you. So, going back to the resource room, if somebody were interested in coming in and and going through the historical documents and photos, what would that look like? Would they contact somebody? Are there certain hours that that's open? Thank you for asking. You're welcome. The museum in its entirety is um, unfortunately only open on Saturdays and the third Sunday of each month from two to four. So there's a small window that you can come out there and as I said, you can have a self-guided tour or we'd be happy to talk for two hours. We would like to have the museum open more often, but of course that depends on getting more volunteers out there, folks. If you're listening, we could use volunteers as greeters to just keep the museum open for us. Two hours, that's all. Um, So you can come out on Saturdays for two hours, and then other than that, you can come out by appointment. You can come out by special, we do special tours. I'm in charge, I'm the archivist at the Resource Center. And our resource center is open on Mondays and Wednesdays from 1 to 4 or by appointment at any time. Fantastic. And I know every year one of the big highlights of the school year are the kids who get to go out and spend a day learning about what life was like in early East County. Boy, you have that right. It is great to come out and watch those little kids do that. They are so excited when they get there. They've been prompt and prepped before they come to us, so they know a little bit about the history of the local area, which is part of the third grade curriculum. And close to 1,500 of them come out 
every year and share a day with us. And it takes the entire day, and they they get to to write with a quill pen. They're too cute because like their little tongues are sticking out, <laughs> and they're trying to write with these quill pens. I'm 41, and I still stick I my tongue out sometimes <laughs> when I write. <laughs> you know, we have the school marm who does the little lesson, and um, they they so that's interactive. Um, they get a tour of the house, each room, and the special one, of course, is the children's room. Um, one of the highlights is they get to make ice cream, they oh. get to make butter, then they get to eat it. <laughs> and then there are those special occasions when the, when the children come out, and I'm not sure how many of those we do, but they dress in traditional outfits that you would have dressed in during that time period. And the added attraction is you can only bring something for lunch that you could have gotten in the 1880s. Oh, that is so fun. My youngest is so in, no lunchables. <laughs> <laughs> My youngest is in third grade next year, and I'm already looking forward to chaperoning. <laughs> great, you can be a chaperone. Yes. Let me know. I'll meet you out there. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> we have a covered a replica of a covered wagon that the settlers would have come out in, and we also have a fully re- the fully restored one and only uh, Byron Hot Springs. Studebaker omnibus that went from the hot springs to the railhead, picked up their passenger, or picked up their guests, and took them back to the hot springs. That is really cool. And of course, you have the caboose out there, which all the kids. Love. Thank you, because I wanted to mention the caboose. I don't know what it is about little guys, but you mentioned caboose, and they're gone. <laughs> they're on the caboose, in the caboose, climbing up the caboose. Oh yeah. Um, so that that's a real attraction, especially for the little guys. And uh, you can ring the school bell. And um, one of the things I like to do is the siren on the Byron uh, tr- Byron fire engine. And for my own curiosity, is Blue still around? Is is he still? He is in memory. In Aww. fact, he's in the Brentwood Press this week. Uh, Blue was getting a little bit old, and we've had we had had him for a long, long time. Gosh, that's hard. Whenever Blue would hear the gravel crunch in the driveway, he'd come running out and fan himself and shake his feathers and then got really upset if it was only me. (laughs) Blue is a peacock, for those of you who don't know. (laughs) Blue was our peacock, and he greeted all of the third graders that came out there, and that was a highlight of his day. It really was. I have some, I'll I'll have to send some photos. I have some photos of him from a few years ago. I'll send along. So in memory of Blue, we have a golf cart we use to run around the museum, and they have how do you say, not decorated, they have converted the golf cart to blue. Yeah, I saw it in the parade. It was in the parade. (laughs) Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but I'm glad that he lives on in spirit. He does. I would love to know why you feel that it is important to continue to teach people about the history and the legacy of the area that we live in. I think it's vitally important for people to know the history of the area that they live in. I mean, how are people going to know who they are if they don't know the history of their area? How are they going to know what to stand for and what they need to protect? You need that pride of ownership in order to stand for something. And I think, you know, I think understanding your history gives you that pride of ownership beyond the house and the car that you own. You also own the community. And part of your responsibility in being a citizen in that community is to participate in community events, and to protect and respect and speak for your community. And you can't do that if you don't know the history. So that's why I think history is so important. And it's not just important for the little third graders to learn. You can see it in the eyes of the parents. They drop their phones, put them in their pockets, and start listening. You go, wow, I think they might be interested in this. Well, and history is such a fascinating subject you know, in my personal opinion is there's not enough emphasis put on it. You know, the big emphasis in school these days is math, you know, STEM subjects. Not that there's anything wrong with that, you know, in English. And and I feel like a lot of the arts and history and, and even uh, some of the sciences, they've fallen off a little bit. And, you know, what is the quote? If you don't learn about your history, you are doomed to repeat it. Oh, for sure. I was a history <laughs> teacher. And here's one of my quotes for, for the Brentwood area, or for our entire area here. If a country doesn't feed itself, 
then it's dependent on the country that feeds it. And we still feed ourselves pretty much. And I don't know about other people in Brentwood, but I feed myself in Brentwood, literally. Yes. Like you said earlier, why, there's really no need. I mean, I love to travel, don't get me wrong, but for your basic necessities. There's no need. Brentwood has everything we that have you it. need. Yeah. You don't need you don't, yeah, the you Amazons don't, of the world and the, you know. Well, you and you don't need, you need strawberries. I mean, sorry, you don't need cherries in December. Right. <laughs> for, for sure. Right. Just wait until spring and there'll be plenty of cherries. We froze so many last year that even picking this year, we still have had left some in the freezer. Yes. By the way, corn freezes very well, and you can use that in soups and stews. And man, it is the season right now, that is for sure. So I would love if you would share with us maybe one of your favorite stories or anecdotes. It doesn't necessarily have to be a personal one, something that you've you've learned in your time with the Historical Society of, quote, old Brentwood. Since I was born here and didn't really leave here, except for the short period of time I was in New Mexico on the Navajo Reservation, I didn't learn it from the Historical Society. I learned it because I'm, I lived it. And that is that everybody was friendly. It was small. Everybody knew each other. So my remembrance is that one of the big deals when you were in the eighth grade, was you had to pass the Constitution test before you could go to high school. <laughs> and so, you know, I studied really hard, and everybody's nervous, and yeah, I'm going to pass it. I got 100%. Nice. I was so excited. I hurried home to tell my mom I got 100% on the Constitution test, the only one that, that got 100%. And I walked in the door, and my mother said, so you got 100% on the Constitution <laughs> test? <laughs> well, and I went, well, 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 who told you? And she said, everybody. Oh. So that's kind of my story. Everybody knew immediately. How did they find out? I have no idea. <laughs> but my mother knew before I got home. It's that little um, telephone game of teacher to parent to parent. Yep. Because, like you said, everybody knew Everybody knew everybody. Yeah. And it was like, whoa, Doreen got 100%. Well, congratulations. Well, that's <laughs> probably my biggest claim to fame. <laughs> no. <laughs> and then, of course, everybody was just really nice to everybody and supportive. And when you went someplace, they knew you. So you didn't have to be nervous. Like that. Yeah. I feel like Brentwood has retained at least a little bit of that. I feel, and, and I've said it. A million times when there is a need in the community it always seems to to be met somehow whether it is a small business or a family we really come together strongly as a community and it's one of the things that i love the most about being in brentwood i've only been out here for seven years so you know i'm still a newbie in the grand You're scheme newbie. of things <laughs> but it, it's something that i've i've seen from the get-go and it really, it really speaks strongly to me. Thank you for saying that, because I agree with you. I agree with you strongly. I think the city government has tried very hard to, to keep that culture alive in Brentwood, to keep that attitude alive. The clubs that existed back then when I was a kid still exist today. They try very hard to continue to foster that uh, environment and that culture of, of hometown Brentwood. They put on, as well as the city and the chamber, numerous events. I was totally excited and happy about the 4th of July parade. It was a wonderful turnout. You were there? Yes. Great. I, I drove my, my former student, Johnny Rodriguez, in the parade. I'm his driver. I drive him all the time. In all parades, any time. I drive Johnny. So I'm driving Johnny in the parade, and we start out, and we go, my gosh, these people are four people deep. Well, by the time we get to the Delta Theater, they were five and six people deep. And when we got to the end of the parade, they were still five and six people deep. So I was so excited. It was really love, And I love... I love a good hometown parade. I love a parade. <laughs> I will stop anywhere in my travels, no matter what time of day, and watch a parade. Yes, yes. And and for me, it was marching band, right? Whenever there was a parade, 
we were always in the parade. Veterans Day, Memorial Day, Christmas, Fourth of July, you know, any parade, we were always there. And, you know, it, those those things stick with you. Oh, they stick with you forever. And, and those little kids that had an opportunity to be in our hometown parade, the Fourth of July parade, you're right. That's going to stick with them. Oh, they love it. Forever. Is there anything else that we haven't discussed that you'd maybe like people to know about? Well, not really, but yes. <laughs> I would like for you guys, all of you out there, uh, to come and visit the museum. You can go to our website, which is eastcontracostahistory.net. Uh, we have a new website. Uh, you can see the events that are occurring there. We're going to have a barbecue coming up in September. And we're going to have, we haven't had one in three years, a yard sale. Yeah, so that will be fun. Um, our phone number's on there, and there's also on our website. And also on our website is a way that you can communicate with us if you'd like to come out for a private tour or like to come out to the museum and visit uh, outside the hours that are advertised, and especially if you'd like to come and do some research uh, in the Resource Center. Perfect. And then, of course, you'll have your holiday Get together as oh, well. Oh, we're going to. Uh, last year, we were finally able to have the uh, holiday event. It was wonderful. Yeah, the uh, festival. And so we were, go we're already planning for that this year. And one of the things that I want to put out to you guys that didn't go last year or didn't see it, when we were planning it three years ago before COVID hit, um, you know, we're sitting around the table going, we're going to have this, we're going to have that, we're going to do that. We're going to light the Christmas tree at the end of the day. And I, uh, somebody said, why are we lighting a Christmas tree? Everybody lights a Christmas tree. We'll have our Christmas trees already lit. Why don't we light our windmill? So that's what we did. I love it. Well, it was quite a feat, but um, we rigged that thing up, and we lit the windmill for, I believe it was a whole month. So please come out and join us. The event was going to be bigger and better this year, the Christmas event. Um, it's for young people and older people, and at the end of the day, we're going to light the windmill. Wonderful. And then for those of you who this wasn't enough history for, Doreen is going to be writing an article for the paper regularly, right? It's going to be a regular feature. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, I will. <laughs> Somehow I mentioned when we were talking about offering classes, and it wasn't necessarily at the Historical Society. I was talking to some other historians and, and authors, and um, they were talking about offering some classes at Los Madanos, at the outreach at uh, Trilogy. Okay. Oh, right. the new, the Brentwood the, Center. The Brentwood Center. Yes. Thank you. I don't know exactly the proper name, but it's out there by the John Marsh House. Um, it overlooks the John Marsh House, It's actually. a beautiful location. It is a beautiful location. Um, and they offer community classes out there. So there will be some classes offered that have to do with local history. And I just happened to mention, well, gee, you could offer a whole class based on the road signs that are in our local area. And somehow that morphed into an article that articles that will be um, published in the press. And I've talked to them, and I think we'll do it probably twice a month, every other week, something like that. But I believe the first one will be coming out very soon, and it will feature some three, four, actually, uh, streets in Brentwood, and I believe the next one will be Oakley. Fantastic. So look forward to those. I'm kind of excited about it because the more I look, the more ideas I get. <laughs> For sure. I, well, and, and just in driving, you know, I, I see a lot of the street names, Obviously, Balfour Guthrie, we talked a little bit about today. Correct. Dainty was a name that Thank I... Thank you for mentioning <laughs> Dainty, O'Hara, Sellers. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I saw all of those pop up in those history books. Great. Uh, which I believe you can also purchase. The you museum can has also little... purchase those at the museum. Yeah. <laughs> so definitely, you know, I did, I last minute got mine from the library, but if you're going to, to order those, and I know they're in several locations around town as well, but... You know, definitely go get them at the museum. It, it gives a little, support, little boost. Support your local museum. You can order them online or you can buy them when you visit us or come to one of our festivals. Fantastic. Doreen, thank you so much for being here. This was a truly amazing little slice of the, the wider area history. I feel like 
we could have you back and we could talk all about Oakley next time. I feel like we focus very heavily on Brentwood. But again, I can't encourage people enough to go out, take some time out of your weekend and visit the East Contra Costa History Museum. It's for everybody and it's not just Brentwood history, right? That's absolutely correct. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, We are not the museum for Brentwood. We are the museum for the entire East Contra Costa County. Brentwood, Byron, Knightson, Oakley, Discovery Bay, Bethel Island, and all the little islands that surround Bethel Island. So we are the caretaker of all of their history. And come see us. And we'll share that history with you. Fantastic. Thank you again so very much. That is it for today's episode of Clocked In With The Press. Many, many thanks to Doreen for chatting with us. And definitely be sure to keep an eye out for her upcoming articles in the press. We really appreciate you taking the time to listen in. Please tune in next week when we'll be talking to Oakley Police Department's Chief Paul Beard. Also, be sure to tune in every Friday for our weekly news and sports episode. If you would like to read more news stories of East Contra Costa County, you can do so through our website at www.thepress.net or through our Twitter and Instagram at Press Clocked In. If you have any thoughts on this episode or any other before it, you can email them to podcasts at brentwoodpress.com. That's all I have for you today, but I look forward to next time. This is Melissa, clocking out. When it comes to the home of your dreams, a trusted realtor can help with every step of your home buying journey. The Lucas Group is committed to excellence and personal service in all their sales. Their award-winning team is dedicated to putting their clients' needs first and consists of some of the top local agents. The Lucas Group has partnered with Homelite Inc. and is now an elite certified agent partner for simple sales, trade-ins, and cash offers. Call the Lucas Group at 925-392-8926.